I'm very honored to have with me tonight two lovely ladies. I'm still awaiting one, but I will introduce to the audience Mrs. Christine Niwalo Hussein, who served as a member of parliament for Komoto Manzanilla and Minister of the People and Social Development in the People's Partnership Government. And I am going to say you were one of the most popular ministers in the People's Partnership Government, right? Because I, I hear about you. I, I keep hearing about you all the time, although we have never personally met. Christine also served as special advisor to various ministers of the state and also the prime minister. And she is now back into active politics as the director of elections and membership of the National Transmission Alliance, the NTA party. So Christine, I wanna say welcome to you. We are awaiting Ms. Wendy Francis, who is the president of the Wendy Francis Foundation which is an MPO that is focused on building and empowering communities through learning, self-development, and humanitarian aid. Wendy is uh, no stranger to our platform. She has sat with us before in her capacity as a local government councillor. She is the former councillor for the Electoral District of Felicity Endeavour, and she will be joining us shortly. So Christine, I have no choice but to kick off the, uh, the panel discussion with you. And I want to refer to a social media post that you would have done in response to the 2024 budget, where you describe the budget as, I'm quoting, not only a major deviation from the truth of the state of our nation, but a false sense of security to the most vulnerable. Can you please, please explain how you came to this assessment? Sure. Let me say good evening to you, Lisha, and to all those who are on the Zoom this evening. Good, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to represent the National Transformation Alliance. So I sent out this release, um, the National um, Transformation Alliance. And one of the things that we recognize is that, um, first of all, this government is a stranger to the truth. They spoke about, you know, this um, great uh, uh, economy, this buoyant um, economy, and that, you know, employment was at an all-time high. And uh, that is furthest from the truth. And it was exactly to say that this, um, this whole statement that was made um, is, in fact, furthest from the truth. Um, and our nation is, in fact, in, in dire straits. And, um, and it is as though this government feels that um, they can tax their way into, uh, into prosperity. And so because of it, it really gives one a false sense of security, especially the most vulnerable, because when you begin to bring new taxes, um, you, 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 you put more burden on, on the most vulnerable. So that's what I meant by you know, saying that it's a deviation from the truth. And, um, and of course, uh, it's a, a false sense of security. I'm not hearing you. Sorry about that. I forgot to put myself okay. there, right? I want to continue to discuss with you some of the initiatives that were taken, specifically aimed at helping the poor and vulnerable. And I want to get your thoughts on these initiatives. So the first being the minimum wage. Now, folks, anyone from the audience, please feel free to jump in. If you want to make a contribution, as I said, feel free to raise your hand, put any questions on the chat, right? So first of all, the minimum wage. So from January 1st, 2024, the minimum wage will be increased by $3 from $17.50 to $20.50. Do you think that this will be effective at helping the poor and vulnerable? Not really, you know. Um, first of all, you have to understand that a, a lot of businesses, because of the introduction of um, Venezuelans coming in onto the um, employment um, businesses are allowed to hire uh, Venezuelans without paying NIS, you would find that a lot of locals, a lot of, um, of persons who are Trinidad, Trin, are unable to find employment. So really and truly, 
as a result of increasing it, it doesn't really impact upon uh, our locals because you're not going to um, benefit from it because you're not being employed in the first place. And further to that, I don't even think that the um, Venezuelans will benefit from that as well because I don't think that they are entitled. The, the law does not, does not protect them in that regard. So I believe that the government has placed the burden of making the lives of citizens better by placing it on the businesses and saying, well, you know, look, we have passed this, so the businesses um, are responsible for your, um, for your prosperity, for your, um, your development. And in fact, it may not happen. So I think, it's a, again, it comes back to that false sense of security. And of course, you just have, um, you just have persons coming in into the workplace and not being able to, to benefit from, from anything because remember NIS is a, is a buffer. If anything happens to you on the job, you're able to, to claim and, um, benefits, whether it's sickness or injury, you know, workman um, compensation, um, um, maternity, a number of benefits that you can claim. But if it is a, the employee cannot, is not um, able to contribute or, he's not, he's not, or he is unemployed, then they cannot benefit in any way. So the country loses because there's no contribution to the NIB fund and the, the um, employee use, loses because he's not gonna get the increase because the jobs are going to, 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 the, to those who are outside. Okay, I see joining us is former counselor Wendy Francis, president of the Wendy Francis Foundation. Wendy, welcome to our program. It's lovely to have you here with us tonight. Thank so, you, Alicia. Right. We were discussing, and maybe you'd like to just uh, chip in a little bit, the minimum wage increase. I know you're on the ground. You do a lot of work with the poor and the vulnerable of this society. And that is something I've always admired Wendy for. It's one of the things that sort of drew me towards Wendy. So, Wendy, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the minimum wage going from... 1750 to 2050 and do you think that will have a positive impact on the lower income earners thank you leisha good night everyone um for those of you that are also joining us on all the social media platforms as well um leisha thank you for the opportunity to join your program and also um share my views as well and um thank you um with regards to what you are asking um in terms of the proposed um wage increase by three dollars um in my humble opinion i don't think that that is something that is sufficient for the general population um and i say that because we there are many factors that we need to look at um the current state of affairs uh we just um came or or have been through a global pandemic with COVID 19 and um being a, a former counselor um, prior to that also being on the ground doing a lot of humanitarian aid um, initiatives and so forth which i continue under my foundation the wendy francis foundation um, i continue to stay in touch with the population the persons the families that are on the ground as you would um would have mentioned i continued to do several initiatives um and preparation of food and distribution um, is something that I do on a weekly basis. So I am very occurring with um, market prices and that type of thing, um, going to the grocery and buying, you know. Um, I mean, general population would normally go to the grocery and purchase their groceries to provide for their families. And what we have seen is a lot of items that are being increased. Um, take, for example, the market prices, you know, um, that has really increased a lot. And the average family, whereas they would go with two dollars or they're about to purchase markets on a weekly basis. Now you have to go with at least four and five hundred dollars in order to make um a, a, a proper um purchase in the market. So to say that we have increased or there is an increase by three dollars from seventeen fifty to twenty fifty. To say that is an insult is to say is the least because that uh, when you look at that in proportion to um, the other increases or proposed increases as well, because market prices, grocery prices are just one um, factor in terms of food. 
providing for your family, your children in terms of food. But what about um, the land tax that, that is going to be implemented as well, the property tax um, and electricity rates? These things would also have a ripple effect. And um, not only that, but having to provide uh, or pay higher costs for those um, things such as electricity, it's going to obviously um, increase prices of other things. So when you're paying for, um, I think uh, food prices are increased by 47%. I'm not certain. I can't, don't quote me on that figure. I could be wrong. Um, but I believe it was 47%. Um, that's for the raw um, resource that is. But when you when you were to purchase, let's say you are to purchase lunch or you are to purchase from a restaurant, the prices also is going to be increased apart from the food, you know, um, generally for other other items because of the electricity rates is also going to increase. So that three dollars really cannot compensate or it's not in proportion to all these different um, factors that is going to affect everybody, not just the upper class or the middle class, the lower class. We now have to really look carefully to see if we would even have a uh, um, lower a differentiation between the lower and middle class you know um, apart from that uh, many persons are already if you look at the um, employment uh, rate uh, versus the unemployment rate um, i would have heard um, that we, we we had a an increase in employment rather than unemployment but <laughs> The truth and fact is many persons and companies went into receivership, but many persons are unemployed and still are unemployed, actively seeking employment. And when you thereby add this further burden on these persons, what is to happen to these, not just persons, but by extension, their families, their children, you know, um, there, there are many other items or factors that are also being increased simultaneously so that's a really really great uh burden on the general population of trying to be cool. i am you Alicia. yes wendy i want to thank you for that contribution now i felt it important to invite wendy here today because she is on the ground and she actively does a lot of charitable work to help the poor and the less fortunate. When is something I want to zone in on? I know you do meals every weekend, is it? Is it every weekend you prepare meals, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that project and why do you feel that that was necessary and very much needed? Sure. Um, well, prior to going into local government and then going into local government into Dece in December 2019 into 2020, there and then we would have seen um, the rise of COVID-19 in other areas of the world until it was officially declared in Trinidad in 2020. It was inevitable that it was going to Trinidad and Tobago. And being on the ground, I would have had a lot of people reaching out to me, a lot of families, a lot of single parent families as well, um, reaching out begging, crying for meals, a basic necessity as food. And my heart really, you know, sank knowing that so many people could not have afforded food. Everyone mostly had to stay at home until the restrictions made it in such a way that you have to stay at home. A lot of people be, um, were unemployed. A lot of person, a lot of companies went into receivership and stuff. So when that happened, um, apart from just staying home and wondering when we had to go back out to work, when we would get an income to purchase food, that type of thing. Groceries were closed. A, a, a lot of places, um, you know, and a lot of people were unable to access food. Um, I I would have sought the assistance from various uh, commercial entities. A lot of private uh, Good Samaritans also reached out to me. Uh, provided aid to which I then extended to persons in need. Um, so they gave the uh, extensive rise in the need for persons needed that further help and assistance. And at that point in time, everyone was vulnerable. The thing is, coming out, moving out over the couple years out of the pandemic, and as restrictions um, rose, some companies came back on stream with the struggle. 
and many of them still struggling up until today, you know, and um, the struggle continues. However, those that went into receivership, they suffered major losses. Persons that were employed with these companies further mm -hmm. also suffered because then they were unable to have an income to provide for themselves and their families. Now, food is just the basic necessity that we are talking about, a major necessity that we need to live. Coming out of that time as well, um, a lot of parents could not even afford milk for their babies. Um, a lot of single parents as well. So therein lies uh, many issues. And from that, um, the my work continued because although some persons gained back employment, there were many persons left without a job. Many persons were trying. Um, there were various initiatives I, I, I would have embarked on and completed successfully. Take, for instance, how to open your own baking business. I tried to think outside the box where we could have assisted persons not only to um, look for a handout, but rather also uh, grow and develop themselves in such a way that they can now provide for themselves and their family. At least try to aid in that area. You know, um, you know the famous saying, um, give a man a fish, but a uh, fisherman may give a man a, a fish or teach a, teach a person um, fish. So what I tried to do was actually try to give them a solution, provide a, a, an avenue in which they can also help themselves and something that they can also continue when and if they do um, receive gainful employment. And that was to set up, you know, some sort of a, a baking business where that they can, um, you know, provide their services, provide um, those items and gain some sort of an income to help themselves, you know. And I, I would encourage persons to continue doing so in the times that we are living in now. You know, long ago, you would think that, you know, we are looking for a job to have one income and that stable income that we can provide for ourselves and our families. But with the rise in increasing, uh, increases rather in, in food, um, house like i say we're gonna have property tax we're gonna have you know the increase in electricity and you, know, you cannot even depend on one salary and how with the minimum wage that they assume that you know we we, we um the general population is going to receive three dollars which is really insignificant um in, insufficient and it's really not in proportion with all the other a number of other increases you know so um you're really going to have to look and for multiple um, streams of revenue income. Okay, thank Isha, you. I also would um, like to um, add to that, that um, during the um, COVID uh, lockdown, you realize the number of parents, how many parents depended on the school feeding program. The, the, the children received, actually received a meal. If they didn't receive a meal at home, they were guaranteed to receive a meal when they went to school. So it showed how critical the school feeding program is. Yes, definitely. Oh. Leisha, before we move on, there was one thing I wanted to add to that is that the increase in, in our, um, the immigrants that came to Trinidad as well. So whereas you would have just to deal with our population, now we have many other persons, bodies, children included that we have to provide for because they are no part and parcel of our population. So that brings me to my next point. But before I get on to my next point, I want to welcome Trini, Kasraj, Calvin, Gary, and Barbara. They are here with us every week, and I do appreciate the support, guys. As I said before, you know, we want to make it as interactive as possible. So we are welcoming any comments, any questions. Right, there are some other initiatives that uh, would have been presented in the budget. The market box program, for instance, 60 million will be allocated to in 2024 in the first instance for the resumption of the market box program. And also we have the school supplies and book grant. So based on a means test, a school supplies and book grant of $1,000 will be provided to parents of primary and secondary school children to assist with school expenses. Do you all think that these initiatives will really be helpful? Are they sufficient? Well, while I was a member of parliament, I could tell you that um, 
the same persons who receive food cards were the persons who were um, the beneficiaries of these market boxes. So the pool remained small. It did not expand outside of the school feeding program. The other aspect was that um, sometimes the, 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 the produce, by the time it, it came to your office, um, it, there was already deterioration um, had set into the, some of the food items. But um, I think more importantly is that a number of these farmers have not been um, compensated for, for what was supplied back then. And so as a result of it, I don't know if they would be willing to um, continue with that program in light of the fact that they have, um, they're still outstanding monies, one. Two, there's the issue of land tenure that is still outstanding. You have the inability to really um, access the necessary um, chemicals to, um, to, for the proper um, supply of your, your soil, you know, these things have also gone up. So when you, you have um, these farmers are faced with all those um, issues that have not been resolved and it doesn't seem as though the government um, has any intentions of uh, resolving them, you, you wonder whether or not the, the, the purposes of, of assisting persons through these boxes will in fact materialize. You know, um, there has not been much of an um, increase to agriculture. Agriculture is the least of this government's concern. You know, to them, agriculture is importation of food. And, and that cannot be, you know, persons have to be able to be encouraged to, to grow their own food. Farmers have to be given a, an incentive. You have to look at um, um, Pridio Lassini. They, they don't look at these things. As a matter of fact, you know, crime is at an all time um, high and, and that includes Pridio Lassini. Um, persons are, are desperate and they will go into, into somebody's farm and, and, and whether, whether they're desperate or not, they are going into the farms and they are in fact removing um, items that are not even used, they're stealing it. That's what it's called, it's called stealing. And then they go out into the market. And so the farmers are losing constantly, um, whether it is from a, a lack of um, the ability, because if the land tenure is extremely important because if you have floods and so forth, you cannot, um, you cannot make a claim because the land is not vested in, in your name or you haven't received permission to, 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 to plant. So with, with, you know, the rainy season, thank God it wasn't as bad as it has been before, but it, it still is because once you lose crop, you lose crop. And if you lose crop and you're not compensated, then you, how can the farmer now extend credit to a government who is not, in fact, um, honoring that credit? So I think it's, it's going to be a backlash. The government can say whatever it is they want. They can make how many promises they want. But the fact is whether, whether it will be materialized at the end of the day. And the pool, as I said, remains the same, um, same person. It hasn't ex extended itself. And as I have said before, we have the, the dwindling middle class and you have now a working, um, working poor and they are not included. They will not be included because of the fact that the means test, because you, you spoke about a means test, the means test really supposed to put you in a place where you have to identify your home, how many rooms, you know, whether you have a washing machine, whether you have a, a television. So these conveniences now become <laughs> becomes a hindrance to you um, being able to pass this means test because you're considered to be um, affluent, you know, middle class. So it really works against you. Damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So I, I think that the government is really fooling persons. And furthermore, you spoke about the, um, the, the, the book grant. The book grant has always been there. <laughs> it has always been there, it was there in my time. So for them to come out and say, hey, this is book grant. Again, it comes back down. The same pool of persons will benefit. It doesn't go outside of that pool. So really and truly, it's only one group of persons that are benefiting and it's a very small group. And you used an interesting uh, term there, the working poor. And I actually read, I think, in, in one of your social media posts, you had also used that term, the working yeah. poor. And I meant to make a note to ask you, what do you mean by the working poor? Well, the working poor, 
I don't know why it is your work or why anybody else is, you know, anybody else would work, but you work because you want to be able to elevate yourself. You want to be able to own a home. You want to be able to own a car. You want to be able to travel. You want to be able to go out and eat. You want to be able to enjoy life, you know, but working poor, the working poor, all they're doing is to work to pay bills. You know, they have to pay the, and, and none of them weren't paying bills before, you know, but there is very little left over to enjoy the fruit of your labor. And you know, when you think about okay. fruit, you think about something good, you think about something to eat, and yet persons are unable to eat and to enjoy, you know, um, what it is they're working for because everything is going in, whether well, it's increased rent because the, the, the landlord now has to, um, has to um, make up for his increased taxes or is it increased electricity, you know, whatever increases that would have hit the landlord is passed on to the renter, your mortgage, you know, the, 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 the banks are, are looking to do all sorts of things. Or will they increase, you know, the interest rates on, on mortgages? What it is it they, they plan to do? You know, the vehicles you have literally um, removed the, the um, foreign, the foreign used um, trade. So now uh, a lot of Persons that a lot of public servants depended upon these um affordable vehicles to be able to you know enjoy life you know to be able to move around to, to take their family out, but because of all these things being removed systematically from the system, you find that persons are just literally working to just barely survive, and that is what I mean by the working poor. Okay, I see Trini has his hand up there. So Trini, I'll allow you to take the mic. Hi, good night, um, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'm um, gentlemen so far. <laughs> um, welcome, um, Christine. It's a long time we haven't chatted. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Wendy. Um, I want to expand on 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 um two things. First of all the minimum wage. Minimum wage, the, the government gave them $3 in addition to the minimum wage. And basically what that amounts to is approximately, if you work it out for a 40-hour week, for four weeks for the month, it works out to $480 additionally that they will be receiving. But now they will have an increase of approximately 40 to 50% in their electricity rates. They might have increase in water rates. They might have to pay property taxes. And on top of all of that, there will be increases. There will be an automatic inflation on, on your commodities prices in your groceries. So technically, what the government did is gave them $3, which amounts to roughly $480. And then you would get about $50 or $60 on your electricity bill, another $50 or $60 on your, on your, your water rate. Uh, two hundred dollars on your property tax. So tech, and then you with the inflation on your your commodities and your grocery stores because the, the 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 supermarket owner is going to increase his prices because he has to pay electricity bills for all those air conditioned units and 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 refrigerators and so on. So so they will be spending that same four hundred and eighty dollars will be spent basically to offset that. So technically, it's giving you on with the left hand and taking it back with the right hand. Um, another thing that we see with the minimum wage, who are the people who get minimum wages? 90% of them are the people who work in the KFCs and the price mass, the people you see pushing trolleys and packing shelves in, in, in uh, massive stores and so on. The menial workers in these, these um conglomerates. They are the people who in these stores and, and so on. These are the people who work for minimum wages. Construction workers work for a little more than minimum wages. Experienced people, welders and, and masons and so on, they work for more than minimum wages. So technically, they are helping some of their voter banks who work for the menial wages. Welders and menial wages in, in these um, conglomerates, some of their financiers. Um, coming to this aspect that um, Christine just spoke about there, um, remind me of it again, I, I forgot. The working poor? The, excuse me? The working poor? No, the, the, what, what was the last topic you just spoke about? We were speaking about um, agriculture. 
all right about... the food, food the food baskets right yeah the food the food baskets the wow. government touted a large figure which sounds to be a large figure 60 million dollars being allocated to the food basket program now that is 60 million dollars for the year if you work out that 60 million dollars for the year and you do the division for the 12 months and how many food bags they're going to be sharing, it works out to approximately, and you work it out for, let's say, equal distribution per constituencies, and there are 41 constituencies, it works out to approximately 609 food bags per constituency. So for every 30,000 people, every month, they are going to share 609 food bags in each constituency. Is that helping the poor? How is that helping the poor? How many poor people do we have in each constituency? TN Tech, when they did their, their RIC surveys, TN Tech told us in Tobago from the RIC, they told us that they assume from their, their um, use of electricity, their billing cycles, they have found out, they, they announced that there are at least 300,000 people, consumers, homes, households, who are below the poverty line, who they consider as vulnerable citizens, who they will be giving rebates to for electricity. If there are 300,000 people and you are, your 60,000 is only allocating food, food bags for roughly 150 to 200,000 people, it means you're still going to have at least 100,000 to 150,000 poor people who are still below the bread line. The minimum wage at $20 and 50 cents per hour works out to be 3200 a little over $3,200 per month. How many of us can supply, can survive with a family of, let's say, four people, two parents and two children with 3200 paying rent, which is approximately $1,500 to $2,000 a month, paying rent in a normal home, paying oh. electricity, and so on. It, it's impossible for poor people to survive in Trinidad and Tobago, and we, and we fail to see that. And the government fails to see that, and they're fooling out with, with, with their budget with these large numbers, which mean nothing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution, Trini. So that brings me to my next question, right? Do you think that now is the time to implement property tax and increase electricity rates? Gary will take you after this question. Right, so the question is, do you think now is the time to implement property tax and increase electricity rates? Anyone? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And Wendy, what would you say about that? Definitely not as well. Um, I wanted to contribute a little bit also on the uh, food box, you know, um, as that also would increase, um, have an impact, you know, um, uh, so, so just just to track back on the food box, right? Um, some of these things I I, I want to I want to commend um Christine and Trinity to the Bone for their analysis, a very detailed analysis by Trinity to the Bone as well. I like that. Um, however, with the food box, while I I appreciate it and I could see some persons may benefit. However, um, I think there are a lot of um pertinent factors that um they must look at or that they need to consider, take for example, um, they need to provide greater support for our existing or subsistence farmers, our um, the farmers in the rural areas to ensure that they too are part of the program because rather than focus on importing some of these items to put in the food box, what about our farmers? What about uh, placing emphasis and focus on our farmers to ensure that they become part of that food box program? that can then be extended to our population and thereby we invest in our population as well, rather than bringing in those products and our money is going out for purchase of those items, you know, and uh, that will be a sense of um, also encouragement for our farmers as well, because I don't believe a lot of farmers are being able to um, participate or capitalize on that particular initiative, you know, and, um, that will be a detriment to us and our agricultural sector. Um, it has to be something that is more sustainable in, in that sense as well. That would 
that that contribution with regards to placing that emphasis on our existing farmers and our farmers in the rural areas make it a little more um, sustainable for them. So therefore, a more sustainable program is required for that particular initiative um, altogether. Um, also, help those farmers to grow. By doing that, you would help those farmers to grow from small and medium to, to from small to medium size or from medium to larger. Um, that way we invest in our own farmers and our agricultural sector. So while we look at that 60 million being invested in the, the market box, um, we need to really invest not only in the market box, but also in our agricultural sector and our farmers. And, and while that is being said, um, there are a number of factors that affect our farmers that they are very disenchanted about. Take, for example, the water. I, I would have heard Trinity Boone made mention about the water, um, electricity rates. Um, Christine would have mentioned last and Now, these are real issues facing our farmers. You know, I have been hearing these for over the years and nothing, I to me, I have seen nothing because I am very much, as mentioned before, in touch with our people on the ground with the farmers and so forth. Um, also my engagement with the Agricultural Society of Toronto and Tobago as well. And a lot of farmers, you know, don't, they don't feel that the government is placing any emphasis on agriculture or, or uh, on what they do, farming, to provide that food security for our nation. Uh, I, would, I would make reference to um, simple things like infrastructure, roadways, there has been, it is years now I have been lobbying for the Randy Carter Bridge to be um, reconstructed. Uh, prior to it being um, collapsed completely, I would have lobbied for some assistance. And to date, nothing is being done. Therefore, you know, that access for farmers to reach their prop, um, crops, their produce to even, you know, plant, it is difficult for them. So when you add this added burden, now you're taking away from them by not engaging them in this food box program. What is to become of our agricultural sector? What is to become of our citizens of our country? What about food security for our people? So therefore, that also would contribute towards the rising prices. Apart from, let's say, we look at the weather conditions with the heat and with the rainy seasons and flooding, because even if we were to look at flooding, um, you know, I, I recall reaching out to the ministry and so forth to assist with, you know, the drains and those type of things. And those things are not being done in a timely manner or even at all in some areas. So if, if we look at our um, the area here in Felicity, along that Randy Carter area, where, you know, a lot of farmers, their, their crops, they produce will be flooded because the irrigation drains are not being cleaned. And some of that fall would under the purview of the ministry you know, uh, and, and nothing is being done. Um, although some of these access routes are blocked, we still have that predial larceny on a high rise. So coupled with all of the other factors and issues raised, they then have to face their crops being stolen, some of them being um, abused or, or attacked in their, in their farms. You know, um, these are these are real issues that are facing our farmers. So these are things that the government also need to take into consideration, not only just investing 60 million in a, a market box that we don't know where the produce is going to really come from and who is really going to benefit from that market box. Well, I think now is a good time for me to make a plug for our agriculture and now series, which we would have started last week with the Agricultural Society of Trinidad and Tobago. And I am seeing Mr. Donnie Rogers on the Zoom here with us. Donnie is, in fact, a director of the Agricultural Society of Trinidad and Tobago, and he was one of our panelists on last week's program. So, Gary, I see you have your hand up. I'm going to allow you to take the mic. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, um, I see two lovely ladies on board here tonight with some very good discussion. Uh, one I do know personally. Um, the our former Minister of Social Development and Family Services, uh, Ms. Christine Hussein, worked closely with assisting me with citizens stranded overseas and getting food supplies and those returning home and getting help and food supplies. So there were so many things behind the scenes, bringing on board uh, uh, people from across the Caribbean and overseas on board to assist us. We uh, we are the, the missionary channels, so that we have a long history 
behind uh, with both of us. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, Ms. Francis. I have seen her. I am very impressed uh, with what I'm hearing. Uh, you didn't run for election this year, right? In this no, local? I, I didn't. Oh, okay, so I was kind of wondering because I didn't see your name. Um, but I want to really commend you on the work that you're doing. And I think uh, connecting with Christine is, you know, it's a, it would make a good impact with both of you uh, being in touch with each other. You know, I really am, it was impressed to see that. Um, yes, the agricultural industry has been, far as I'm concerned, discriminated against uh, with resources and um, not really given the kind of help for the infrastructure uh itself because if we were to invest in infrastructure with the farmers uh, we would minimize a lot of the flooding and save a lot of money and uh we seem the government seems to refuse and no matter what we say uh you know and how hard we try the farmers are not getting the assistance necessary and the money uh, that is allocated is uh, disappeared into i guess maybe their their associates and friends i don't know how it's distributed I, i've heard stories of people getting land and not planting either too, you know, because they were associated with certain people, you know, um, but this is something has to uh, be reiterated among the citizenry because they have to realize that the dependency they have on the farmers, you know, uh, for food supply, I strongly believe that if we create a mass production of food, we can at least feed our people and, and not face that much of a challenge with what's happening on the outside world because we have our own supply of food. We need to work harder and be more committed to that. So I am calling for a lot of mobilization behind our farmers because it's in all our best interests that they succeed. You know, so these are the things I, I would like to say. Um, and I'm happy to hear Donnie Rogers is back on tonight with us here listening. You know, um, he made a very good impression, and I want to do everything that we, or we should do everything to support him in his efforts. Okay, Gary. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just doing a quick time check, and it is now 8.43. So we are entering the last few minutes for questions for any contributions, right? I must say that uh, based on the discussions that we've had so far, you cannot have a discussion on any topic in Trinidad without two things coming up. One is agriculture, and that is related to the high price of food that we face. Mm -hmm. And the other topic is crime. And those two things are central to almost everything else that you try to have a discussion about. So I want to move on now to... A question, well, I guess I will pose this question for Christine because I know she has written on it. And this has to do with the national insurance. And the national insurance is important because it is supposed to, and I'm quoting exactly what is written on the website for the NIB, provide citizens protection against the economic and social distress that they may face. No, it seems as though NIB itself is facing some distress, right? Because they, they seem to be having reduced contributions and a very large debt owed by the state. And they are making proposals to increase the retirement age to 65 and also increase the contribution rate that employers and employees have to pay. So, Kristen, what are your thoughts on this situation with NIB and the proposed increase to the retirement age to 65, as well as the increased contributions they are requesting or proposing? Alicia, it's one thing to increase the um, age, retirement age. It's another thing to receive your benefits when you reach that age. And the truth is, I don't know if anyone would receive it. Because of the fact there is a, a reduction in um in contributions, as I indicated earlier, with uh, businesses hiring Venezuelans who are not mandated to contribute to, towards the um the NIB scheme, it means that there's a further um deficit in the amount of monies that have been um collected at the end of the month, and so um there's a a very serious a very grave concern as to whether 
whether um, the, you, you reduce the, 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 the amount of monies that person can actually receive if they chose to um, retire at 60 or onwards, um, whether they will get a, a, a 30 percent reduction as opposed to taking at 65 and getting a, a hundred percent of, uh, of your um, contributions. The, the truth is with it being so severely um, um, reduced, whether persons in fact would get their monies. And you know, there's something that NIB normally sends out every so often, and I would encourage persons to do this. They indicate that you know you should come in and make sure that your um your contributions, your statement is updated. And I think that persons should go in as the ad um suggests and get your um statement to ensure that it's updated. Because if not, you can now go to your employer and indicate my contributions have not been made, particularly if I have a statement that says that I contributed my one third. Furthermore, I think that, um, that the NIB should go after these ministries, such as public utilities and, and all these other um, state agencies who have monies outstanding and ensure that they pay it. They should be held um, accountable and liable um, to, to, to pay these um, monies along with the fines. This is, if you as a business person withhold anyone's um, contribution, you are, are liable to be fined. And I, I don't understand how these things could make the newspapers and there is no accountability. As a matter of fact, a, a, a minister allegedly made a statement, there's a statute you know, of limitation or whatever it is you know, regarding the, the contribution. There's none whatsoever. If that were the case, you know how many businesses would not submit their contributions, but they're held liable and they're charged a 50% fee, you know, and, and, and it goes on every month. If these, if these ministries and state agencies were made to, to account and to pay what is in fact um, due, then it would alleviate a lot of problems that have taken place. And also, this, this problem started with um, um, Mr. Hart when he, he took monies and, and arbitrarily invested it in, into, into ghost um, projects. And he should be held accountable and he should be made to put back the monies. So you, you're trying to make citizens pay for, for somebody else's wrongdoing. Why, why, why should that be? You know, so I think that it, the, 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 the whole aspect of, of, of coming to the age 65 Persons, if they want persons to, to wait until 65, they must be assured that at age 65, I will get my contributions. And in order to do that, persons need to go and do as the ad says and ensure that your statements are up to date and, and protect your interests. You know, the, the onus must be on us to protect our interests. And if it is that you see that your statement does not show it, then we have a right. Go to your union. Go to go to a representative and say, "Listen to me. This is happening, and we need to take make sure that these ministries and state agencies are held accountable." So that's what I think about um about it. I want to thank Roshan. The couple of comments that Roshan has on the chat, right? Roshan, I want to thank you for those comments. I'll I'll just go across to the Trini. Go ahead, Trini. No, I just, I just want, hi, I, I would just want to add to what Christine is saying there. I know of a documented case, a very close friend of mine who worked at ISCOT for almost two and a half years. And then he worked at the Ministry of Education for nine plus years. And none of those contributions have been registered to his name. He went and he checked it at the National Insurance Board and they told him, well, he needs to go to whoever were his employees. Scott does not exist anymore, so I don't know who this guy needs to go to, to to rectify those two and a half years of NIS contributions that were not made to the National Insurance Board. And the Ministry of Education, he went to the Ministry of Education twice and got run around go to this office, go to that person and go to the other person. And nobody seems to be able to regularize his national 
insurance contributions for almost nine and a half years at the Ministry of Education. Now, this is the government not paying the national insurance for that individual. And this is a documented case. I can get you all the particulars. And that is real. Yeah, yes. The, the sad thing is that I have heard of multiple cases like that. Eh? So, I mean, as Christine would have said, please, all employees who are paying NIS contributions, it is going to be worth your time to actually go to NIB and get a record of your contributions and keep doing that to ensure that contributions are being made on your behalf. And we will be returning in our future discussions to talk about what is going on with this national insurance, sir, because it is of critical importance to this country. And things are looking too nice right now for the NIB. <laughs> so, um, guys, it is now 8.52, and uh, I think uh, there's some couple of final questions. Let me just check the chat and see. Okay. All right. So a couple of final questions. Wendy, what is in the future for the Wendy Francis Foundation? Well, um, thanks, Leisha. Um, well, currently we are um, doing the CFI initiative that's serving and empowering the vulnerable always. So on a weekly basis, we continue with our um, preparation of meals for distribution to vulnerable families, the homeless, some homes, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and the thing is, that is not only extended to Central Region. Many persons outside of Central that reach out to me and we make some sort of an arrangement to either drop off or pick up. Um, that has been going on for quite some time. And um, not only with the food distribution, but with hampers and so forth. As mentioned before, a lot of um, many Good Samaritans persons seeing, um, you know, the need they reach out to me so that I can extend to those that are in need. Um, also, the um, commercial entities as well would provide assistance for, with that regard as well. So that continues. Um, this year, as we embark in uh, or draw closer to uh, uh, the Christmas season, um, I'll be holding my fifth annual Christmas toy drive um, extended to the central area. Um, that also has been supported with the um, good um, intention and support from our private citizens as well as uh, those commercial entities normally extend their courtesies to me as well so that, so that we can ensure that these kids and families you know get that hope and love and joy um, experience and that is usually held on Christmas day itself so any of you guys willing to support and those that are viewing um, you can also reach out to me if you want to be a part of this initiative as well as any other initiatives that I have um, embarked on. Um, you can contact me at 287-9908. If you go to the, the Wendy Francis Foundation page on Facebook as well, there is a link that you also can um, um, tap into and you can provide your necessary information and we can make contact yeah, and take it from there. Um, apart from that, there are other initiatives that I have um, or would have undertaken that will continue and those speak to education basically um, overall development and improvement empowering our youths our single women and, and those vulnerable persons um, I have collaborated with several NGOs as well including the Shivtech Foundation which um, we normally would partner and um, extend that uh, service to our youths, whether it is in terms of repairs, so for to their um, devices, be it laptops or um, tablets and so forth, so that they can continue their online learning, uh, facilitate whatever type of learning that they have embarked on um, during the COVID-19 was heavily reliant on these um, communication devices so that they can access their online education. So uh, many of these students would be taking or have been taking um, extra learning um, initiatives, whether it's lessons and so forth. So they utilize these commercial devices as well, uh, communication devices, sorry. So um, that also will continue. Um, earlier this year, I would have um, launched a period poverty 
um, initiative targeting our um, youths of vulnerable young girls, uh, single women, that type of thing. And I was happy to see recently um, Parliament would have issued um, uh, some sort of information regarding data collection with regards to that. Um, I know general population in general is more like it's, a, it's, it's treated like as, as though it's a topic of taboo in nature that you don't want to talk and come out and something that's embarrassing but the truth and facts of the matter is that our uh, maturity rates our young girls our single parents our single mothers um, this is a real issue and this is one of the things that came out of um, not only during the COVID-19 period but I see it on a daily basis where persons reach out, they, they are asking for these type of um, items, whether it's sanitary and those feminine care products. You know, um, I believe this is something that we really need to place emphasis on. Um, and I'm happy, as I mentioned before, that the parliament is actually now acknowledging that. And I hope in the near future, that's something that they would definitely invest in because not only that, but the education about that to, for it to be implemented into our schools, our primary school system and our secondary school system as well. Um, that is something that is born by nature in terms of your menstrual cycle. This is something that the population needs to be um, educated on. Not only our girls, but also our males as well, so that they can understand how um, this affects our females in our society as well. And um, providing the items that... Um, to those that need them is very important as well. Um, so my my um, work towards uh, period poverty also continues. I hope that will continue to grow in a, a larger way as well. Um, as it is, I've also reached, um, persons reached out to me are also not only our local community, but even the immigrants as mentioned before, we have a lot of kids that are not um, enrolled in school or being accepted for education, not general education in school, in the school system. So this also affects them as well. So there are many factors to take into consideration. Um, so as we move forward into the closing of 23 and going into 2024, I would say there's a lot more to look forward um, for and the Wendy Francis Foundation. And um, um, coupled with that, I'd like to see the government also aid uh, the general community and population as well. So, and in closing of Leisha, um, to mention, I don't think the general population is in consensus with the implementation, with the increases of property tax and the power rates and so forth. So they also need to take into consideration all these given factors as mentioned before. And just to, to touch very briefly, because I know time is limited, with the means test, I think that is something that um, is is so, is so much of a barrier because with all the incentives that they talk about that they are providing an opportunity for our population, many, many citizens or many persons from the population cannot access those with this means test because it's very difficult to get even or to capitalize or receive any of these grants or incentives. So I think that those things should be revisited. Thank you, Leisha. Thank you for having me on the program and thank you, everyone. Christine and everyone viewing. Wendy, okay. I want to sincerely congratulate you and all at the Wendy Francis Foundation. And I, I want to vouch for the foundation. They do excellent work. She's when they spoke about the period period poverty initiative they had. Also, she does a lot of training courses and food support. So anyone willing to assist, please feel free to reach out to Wendy. You could always leave a message on our chats and I will be able to pass on the information for her. So okay. Gary, I see you have your hand up so we can probably take a comment for you, uh, from you and then one final question for Christine. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to share, uh, you guys hear me, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I want. I, I was speaking about, you know, during the COVID uh, uh a uh, time when, um, you know, citizens were locked down and, you know, there was a need for hampers. There was a lot of discrimination brought to my attention uh, in the distribution of hampers and food cars and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's something that we have to be very concerned of because citizens wasn't being treated equally. So uh, the things that 
uh, Wendy is doing, we want to encourage people to, you know, to try and support as much as they can, you know, Wendy and whoever else is doing out there to support this kind of organization, uh, you know, in the best way that they can, because they, uh, we still live in situations where people are discriminated against in getting assistance. So I just wanted to raise that, you know. All right. Thank you. Okay, Gary, thank you. So, Christine, I, um, I think this is a great question for us to end off with. What are some of your major accomplishments as Minister of the People and Social Development? And how would you compare the performance of the ministry now as opposed to when you were the minister? Well, there are several accomplishments, but I would like to speak about just one. It's going to be a little bit long. Um, you know, regrettably, Misha, when you get into government, um, ministers and ministries function in silos, you know, separate and apart from each other. And um, for, for me, when I came in, um, I recognize that when you're formulating policy, regardless of who your beneficiaries are, you need to know who your stakeholders, who are your stakeholders, because their stakeholders is what ensures that, that your policy will in fact be um, you know, equitable, it will be um, effective because you want to be able to, to have a ministry that is effective, particularly when you have the Ministry of the People and Social Development. So one of the things that I did was to look at what were the issues are in the ministry. And uh, I looked at the various ministries that, that should be involved in a partnership with um, the Ministry of the People and Social Development. The first one that took number one was Ministry of National Security. Because when you deal with socially displaced persons who are called homeless, you know, Ministry of National Security um, helps in that regard because of the the security that would have to go out onto the street or take to the court system. Um, you look at the prisoners who are coming out, you know, so that national security, you know, helps in that regard so they could alert you as to who is coming out and how the um, ministry could assist in terms of providing um, assistance, uh, providing whatever care that may be um, necessary. And of course, you will never believe this, but pensioners must get uh, uh, a letter from the Ministry of National Security ensuring that they have not lived out or they have not traveled too often. All these things really hinder a pensioner from accessing. So what I did was ha I had um, meetings with the, the Minister of National Security to ensure that, you know, that there was a, a symbiotic relationship between us so that when we needed information that it would have a quick easy flow of information as opposed to having persons go wrong, you know, the system and, and being lost in it. We also would have partnered with the Ministry of Education because you would find that when you want to um, transform a nation, you know, you want to do a national transformation, you have to look at the most vulnerable and sometimes where they have failed would be in the education. So when you look at the Ministry of Education, um, coupled with the Ministry of Tertiary Education, we were able to look at programs, particularly with Fazal. Fazal is dynamic with that in terms of coming up with programs to certify persons who would have done um, courses, whether it's in plumbing or masonry or whatever it is, so that they, they were, were not only um, did their training out, but they would have been certified so that they would have been able to go out there and to become you know, um, gainfully employed. Uh, we would have um, partnered with the Ministry of Trade and with other ministries. So that what we did is that as, as a Ministry of, of the People and Social Development, we, um, we came together with, the, with all the partners, all the ministries, because all of the ministries would impact. With us, we would impact on them and brought together um, uh, 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 in the process of de developing a policy where we would have been able to um, look at the various areas where we could um, uh, ensure that there would have been um, policy developed that would have been, that would have brought about national transformation because we did not want people to remain in poverty. We wanted people to be, um, we didn't want them to get a, a, just get a handout, but we wanted, to be, wanted them to get a hand up so that, you know, even some persons could have been entrepreneurs regardless of the fact that you were um, 
you know, you didn't have an education because, you know, some, a lot of people are streetwise, you know, they know how to do certain things, whether they're good with their hands or they, they're good with whatever it is, whether it's cooking as, um, um, when they alluded to with the bacon. So it was really to help persons really come out of poverty and to be able to have the, the various ministries in place to be able to provide um, the support system. So I think for me, this was, it would have been background. Um, I know that Gary said that he heard a lot and you said, Alicia, but that is what I believe um, made the ministry effective. And, I, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. And that, that is a wonderful way to end the program. I particularly like when you said not a handout, but a hand up. 